Thank you, you Andre, and Lord. thank you for the organizers for the kind invitation to be here today with you. I'm a surgeon, just to clarify. And all of you know that chemoradiation therapy may lead to significant primary tumor regression. Depending on the baseline staging features and the actual regimen you employ, you may end up with up to 40% of a complete primary tumor regression following chemoradiation therapy. And then, regardless of the kind of operation you perform, you may actually end up with a very good specimen of a very neat operation, but ultimately not a single cancer cell left for the pathologist. And then you still have to deal with the significant morbidity, the mortality of this operation. This is just to show you, this is UK data. This is not Brazilian data. And as you can see here, the mortality rate, depending on the age of these patients and the number of comorbidities, may reach as high as 16% mortality. This is a pretty fatal operation. Even if you can put these patients together, meaning that you can perform an anastomosis, suffice this to say that nearly 50% of these patients will end completely incontinent after this operation. So there are significant functional consequences of this procedure. And this is why this lady, Angelita, really challenged the role of radical surgery in this setting. This is not simply no surgery after chemoradiation therapy. This is no surgery, or at least no immediate surgery, after achieving a complete clinical response following chemoradiation therapy. So the basic principle of this strategy is really to assess tumor response after completion of chemoradiation therapy. If you agree to assess tumor response, the first question is, when should we assess response? And there is some data to suggest that the more you wait, the more you get in terms of tumor regression. This is an interesting study from the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and you can see that the complete pathological response rates begin to increase after seven weeks from chemoradiation completion. But they only really plateau after 12 weeks from chemoradiation completion. Meaning, again, the more you wait, the more you may get in terms of tumor regression. But the really difficult question is how to assess tumor response. And digital rectal examination remains as one of the most important tools in assessment of the tumor response to chemoradiation therapy. It should not be forgotten. Now, endoscopic appearance is very important as well. And whenever we perform an endoscopic study, there's always a question, should we biopsy these residual lesions? Well, in the setting of an incomplete clinical response, such as this one you can see here, you have to be careful with the endoscopic biopsies. When these biopsies are positive, you're pretty sure there's cancer there. But however, when these biopsies come out negative, they don't mean this is a complete clinical response. This is the main message here, that a negative biopsy has nothing to do with a complete clinical response. So what is a complete clinical response then? This is what the tumor looked like before chemoradiation therapy, and this is how it looks after chemoradiation therapy. You can clearly see the whitening scar. You can see some okay. telangiectasia there. There's no narrowing of the, of the bowel wall. There's no ulceration. There's no mass. Yeah. You can clearly see, again, this is another case of a whitening of the mucosa. You can clearly spot some telangiectasia. And even, even if you use dyes, to look for any irregularities and orient biopsies, you won't find them. So this is why these patients, we don't even perform any endoscopic biopsies because there's no point in doing so. Now we always perform some type of radiological assessment of these patients. You have to remember when Professor Angelita started all this, there was no MRI, there was no endorectal ultrasound. She had to rely only on the eye and the finger. But now we have radiological tools to rely upon. And this is one of the most important tools nowadays. Initially, we used high-resolution MRI to look within the mesorectum, because the mesorectum cannot be seen and the mesorectum cannot be felt. Now, remember, you have to see also outside of the mesorectum, and sometimes you miss very obvious lesions outside of the mesorectum, and this may happen as well. 
But as MRI and radiology, radiology develops, now radiologists are able to tell us whether the primary tumor itself has regressed completely or not. You have to look for this very low signal intensity, which is basically an estimate of the tumor regression grade as seen by pathologists. They actually call MR TRG status. And when this shows this low signal intensity, they are pretty sure this is a complete clinical response or a complete pathological response. We always thought about the PET-CT studies, and you can clearly see here on the left-hand side an incomplete response because there's persistent FDG uptake following chemoradiation completion in the posterior rectal wall. In comparison, you can see a complete response on the right-hand side where the uptake of FDG has disappeared completely after six weeks and is sustained after 12 weeks from chemoradiation completion. The problem is by looking with this visual uh, uh, assessment of response, the negative predictive value of such PET-CT imaging was pretty low. 73% was probably unacceptable. When a patient had a negative study, it was only truly negative in 73% of the cases. So when we combine the information given by PET-CT, not only in terms of metabolic estimate, but also in terms of volume reduction, you can clearly now have a parameter that clearly correlates with response to chemoradiation therapy. When there is a significant reduction, meaning more than 90% reduction of this parameter called the TLG, which combines SUV and the, tumor, the metabolic tumor volume, you can see that the negative predictive value goes up to 91%. So when the PET-CT is negative, you are correct in more than 90% of the cases. Now, this is probably clinically useful. But as I said, I'm a surgeon, and I heard many times, Rodrigo, why don't you simply locally excise it? You will have an excisional biopsy, and therefore, you will be sure this is a complete pathological response from the pathological point of view. And the pathologist will give you a definitive answer whether this is a complete response or not, instead of looking at scans, digital rectal examination, or even endoscopy. And you can even suture them together quite nicely. These operations are actually very nice to perform, and I like it very much. The problem is they, they look very nice here. The problem is after seven days, this is what happens. It happens because these wounds break down, and they break down because you're putting together two borders of the rectum that have been previously irradiated. So they don't heal very well. And when they open up, they hurt. And most of these patients, if not 50% of them, may have to come back to the hospital for pain control. Now remember, we're, we're doing this for the sake of function. Can you imagine how the function will be after this heals off? And this will heal off approximately 60 days from the primary operation in the best case scenario, and this will be rock hard. This will never function as an intact rectum. As a matter of fact, we compared patients we did a local excision with those we did nothing at all after a complete clinical response, and obviously, patients not managed by any type of radical surgery or local excision did much better in terms of functional outcomes. This is why when we have a complete clinical response, we do nothing. We reassess these patients in a six to eight interval period. And they all know that local recurrence may develop at any time. What we do is a digital rectal examination and a rigid proctoscopy and radiological imaging of these. So the first study we did was the comparison of patients who had a complete clinical response managed by observation alone to patients who had a complete pathological response managed by radical surgery. And there was no difference in terms of overall or disease-free survival between these patients. Now, local recurrences may develop, and you have to be careful. There's some good news about it. Most of these recurrences, more than 90% of our cases in our experiences, were endoluminal, which means they are accessible to the finger and they're accessible to the eye, provided you're giving them good surveillance. Local recurrences has to do with the primary baseline staging features. If you started off with a, with a T3, you're more likely to have a recurrence. If you started off with a T2, you're less likely to have a recurrence. 
The third good news is they're usually salvageable. Most of these patients are usually salvageable by radical surgery or even sometimes by local excision alone. As a matter of fact, if you haven't touched the rectum and you have to go back and do radical surgery, you're pretty much doing the same operation you were going to do in the first place. And the fifth good news is if you have to salvage these patients, there appears to be no oncological compromise. Patients that had to be salvaged because we thought it was a complete clinical response, but we thought it wrong, did not do any worse than patients that had an incomplete clinical response and were managed by radical surgery right off the bat. So this is our usual and old chemoradiation therapy regimen. And those of you who know Angelita knows that she really wanted to push this forward. So we basically implemented three changes to our protocol. We increased the dose of radiation, we increased the dose of chemotherapy, and we increased and stretched a little bit the interval between chemoradiation therapy and assessment of response. By going from 50.4 grays of radiation to 54 grays of radiation, it may look very subtle differences, but this is almost doubling the boost to the primary cancer. We also increased the number of cycles of chemotherapy with five a few only. So instead of the two standard cycles of chemotherapy in the early and uh, end of radiation therapy, we now have six cycles. And this is what it looks like uh, during radiation therapy and also during the resting period after radiation completion. And with this, in order to accommodate those three additional cycles of chemotherapy, we had to slightly stretch the interval between radiation completion and assessment of tumor response. So no patient is assessed for tumor response before 10 weeks from radiation completion. This is our most recent data, recently published at DCNR. You can see the initial complete response rate of all comers, consecutive T2 and T3 rectal cancers, is 67%. And after a median follow-up of four years, almost 50% of these patients never undergone a radical operation. We were the only ones to perform this until the Maastricht group in the Netherlands published their own data pretty much with the same oncological outcomes. No differences in overall survival, no differences in disease-free survival, comparing surgical patients to observational patients. The Danish group uh, published their data with a slightly more aggressive chemoradiation therapy regimen, and they showed more than half of the patients with rectal cancer being managed by observation alone in a two-year interval. We do not have a randomized controlled trial for this. And the, the closest we can get is this propensity score match co-analysis performed by the Manchester group. And they designed this study to show that watch and wait was not inferior to radical surgery. What was curious was that they found that watch and wait was actually superior to radical surgery in this setting. Obviously, the risk for a definitive stoma was much uh, lower in the watch and wait group, even when you consider the local recurrences throughout, over, over the time period. There are now many studies, and this is one of the most recent meta-analyses comparing watch and wait studies. And you can see here that the pooled recurrence rate is about 15%. I personally think this is pretty, pretty um, um, underestimated. And as you can see here, our data is one of the most, uh, with the highest local recurrence rate. I truly believe it depends on many things, including the actual chemoradiation therapy regimen and the baseline and staging the features, and ultimately 30% is a more honest figure. But again, no differences in oncological outcomes in terms of disease-free survival or our overall survival between these patients. So the tide is turning, and a patient with a complete clinical response it may be very difficult to go into surgery in the very near future. And because we don't have any randomized control stu uh, studies, one of, the, one of the ways forward may be um, the development of registries. It's, this is one of the international registry in the Leuven Group um, with uh, Andrea Dorje, who is uh, collaborating with us with many other centers, putting patients into. And if you have patients being managed by observation alone and you're interested in, in putting patients, please contact uh, in this website information. 
I cannot end this presentation with giving, without giving full credit to the true engine behind all this. Professor Angelita was really the, the engine behind this throughout this process, and I'm very happy that she was able to see all stages of this going through. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions.